Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, this is uh, um, a session, if you're looking at the screen, on uh, improving school-based attendance and performance using telehealth-connected oral health teams and virtual dental homes. And I'm Paul Glassman. I'm a dentist, a professor, uh, associate dean for research and community engagement at California North State University College of Dental and Medicine. I've had a 30-year career in dental education, initially at the University of Pacific School of Dentistry in San Francisco and retired from there last year and now helping to start a new dental school in Northern California. So it's a pleasure to be able to be a part of this conference. I've actually spoken at the School-Based Health Alliance Conference um, several times in the past and uh, do a lot of work with systems, which you'll hear about during this presentation about bringing uh, care into schools. My um, professional life is devoted to uh, most of the time a lot of the time is helping to start this new dental school, but I also do consulting. So I'm working with people in about, or have worked with people in about uh, seven or eight or nine different states and conversations with people in 10 or 20 different states who are trying to figure out how to use teledentistry to bring care to where people are in schools and other places. So lots of experience with this issue around the, around the country. And so I'm happy to be able to share some experience and thoughts with you. I think the way we're gonna organize this session is I'm gonna do some presentation of uh, background material for um, about uh, 35, 40 minutes. Um, there is a, a, a Q&A box, which Kelly Bowie, who's our moderator, is monitoring. I, I can't, she can't see it myself, but uh, um, uh, if there's uh, something that's really a clarification of something I just said, um, Kelly, you can feel free to put that in the presenter chat and I'll see it and I can maybe stop. Uh, but otherwise, we'll, we'll have some time at the end for open Q&A. So, um, Send your questions in the in the in the question box, and I'll be happy to have uh, try to allow plenty of time to talk things over as we get towards the, the end of the time that we have here. So um, we'll start with just some numbers, some numbers that maybe you're aware of, but that uh, oral health, uh, dental health, as some people are more familiar with the term, but I tend to use the word oral health, is actually related to school attendance and school performance. Maybe that's why you've attended this session because you're already aware of that, but some data which is that um, showing students with toothaches are four times more likely to have low grade point averages if they're having dental problems. It's just hard to sit in class and learn and pay attention if you have a toothache. Um, that students without access to dental care, um, 10 to 11% of those are on recorded systems uh, missed school compared to only 4% of those who have access to dental care. Um, it's often not actually easy to understand that or the data isn't often granular enough to know when students are missing school. A lot of school districts don't actually track if the reason that they didn't come in today is because of a dental problem or not. They just know they didn't come in. So uh, we wish we had better data, but it's clear the data we do have that you're just much more likely to be missing school if you don't have access to dental care. And um, that among elementary and high school children, 58% uh, of elementary school children, 80% of, of uh, high school children um, missed uh, that number of hours missed respect, uh, respectively over uh, per 100 children uh, missed annually. So lots of school missed, kids in school not learning, and even parents, it affects the parents as well, uh, average two and a half absent days from work or, or uh, per year if their children have dental problems that are not being addressed. So it's clearly related to school performance and health and uh, lots of things that are important to this audience. Uh, a little bit more just national data for a moment in terms of the United States, who's getting dental care, and this is pretty average across the country, although it's actually even worse, a little bit worse in California. But this graph shows who's getting dental care by year and by broken down by age group. So it's showing that children, the orange line, are the most uh, likely to get dental care, about 50% of children in this data, and now it's creeped up a little bit in the last few years, over 50%, but still only about half the children in the country get even what's called an annual dental visit, which is a, a very low bar for whether someone has good dental health or not. It just means that they've interacted with the dental care system once during the year. So that's only about half the children that even interact with the dental care system once during the year. And it doesn't mean they're getting, even those are getting any kind of regular care. And then that certainly is very skewed based on income. This is just combining all the incomes together. So about half children, 40% um, of seniors, and only about a third of working age adults getting dental care at all. Um, that's actually about 200 million people in the, in the United States not getting regular dental care. It's the majority of the population. When you look at it by income, you can see that this is just for children. It's much worse based on income. So that uh, lower income children 
we're talking mummy only a third of lower income children even having that annual dental visit again at the very low bar so clearly a disparity is based on uh, on on income based on uh, location based on uh, demographics and uh, ethnicity and the take home from all that is we have a dental care system in our country where uh, dental care is currently the system is pr currently primarily serving the wealthiest and healthiest segments of the population. In other words, the people who are most likely to go into a dental office and get dental care, and particularly get full dental care, everything that they need taken care of, are the most affluent people, the people who are best educated, and the people who face all the challenges we just mentioned, low income, um, they're not near places where dental offices are, they're working uh, hours that, that are not open when the dental office is, they face language and transportation barriers, those are the people who are most at least likely to actually have dental care and then uh, most likely to have dental disease. So we have a dental care system that's seeing the people with the least amount of disease and people with the most disease are not being served in the dental care system. Now, fortunately, we have some things on the horizon that can help us uh, change that and turn the tide uh, to some degree if we can figure out how to take advantage of them. And I put those in, uh, in the science of uh, what I call both prevention and behavior science. So prevention science, the title of the slide, the declining role for the dental drill. So those of you who are listening who are not in a dental field um, might remember some of you back when I was in dental school, if you had uh, a problem like the kind of problem that's uh, in these um, teeth here in this uh, upper left uh, part, this upper left uh, diagram, those little divots in the front teeth, there was nothing you could do about that other than to get an appointment with a dental dentist in an office and the dentist would uh, take out their drill and drill that out and put in a conventional filling. And now we have all kinds of things that can help to restore the health of a tooth with things called remineralization. So as the enamel starts to dissolve, you can actually uh, repair the enamel. Uh, that's before a piece of the tooth breaks off. But once the piece of the tooth breaks off, um, there's buffering agents, things to keep the saliva from being as acidic. There are caries arresting medications. One drop of this liquid called silver diamine fluoride can stop the progression of decay. There's ways of sealing caries in place that don't take any shots and don't take any drills. I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. All this stuff uh, is really very, very different than when I was in school because it opens up the possibility of uh, treating dental disease and helping people to be healthy without having to be in a dental office, without having to be in the presence of a dentist, without having to have shots without even having teeth drilled on, all the stuff that can be done by a dental hygienist, for example, in a school. Um, these are things that didn't exist when I was in dental school, but we have the science, which is very, very rock solid right now uh, to be able to allow us to think differently. So some of the things I just talked about, product called fluoride varnish, which maybe you've heard about because there are sort of widespread fluoride varnish programs, just painted on the teeth a couple of times a year, can keep teeth that have not yet decayed from decaying to some degree, certainly prevent that very effective um, silver diamine fluoride, once there's already a hole in a tooth, can stop it from progressing. Um, we have things like uh, dental sealants, which have been around for a long time, very effective at uh, keeping decay from starting in the grooves of teeth. And now it's understood it can even be used after decay has already started to seal those, those grooves or beginning decay in place. And then finally, we have something called interim therapeutic restorations, which are uh, small fillings that can be done with small to medium sized holes in teeth that can stop the progression of the decay and seal it in place and keep it from going and can last a long, a long time. I'll talk about that one a little bit more in just a minute. Um, so that's all in, in, I put in the realm of new prevention science that's available that we just didn't have in the past. The other thing is I think we have a very different understanding now about the critical things that it takes to have people have good dental health. We used to think about dental health more as an acute surgical intervention disease. It's a disease that was amenable to surgical intervention, we still think about it that way a lot. You know, someone walks into a dental office and they've got a hole in their tooth and the dentist puts a filling in the hole. Um, that filling in the hole hasn't actually stopped the disease process. The reason they had the hole in the first place that you'll, if you don't change some other things, you're still gonna have uh, that hole in that tooth and holes in other teeth. But um, we think about that, we call that treatment. We actually pay for the filling. We don't pay for interventions to be able to control the disease. So we still have a ways to go to change our thinking, but there's more and more thinking about the fact that we're actually dealing with chronic diseases. A chronic disease is like diabetes where uh, you don't get your diabetes fixed in your visit to a physician's office today, same way you don't get your dental caries disease fixed in a visit to a dental office. They might put a filling in, but that doesn't uh, impact the, the tooth, the, the, the disease. So uh, what we know is 
that um, chronic diseases are uh, require uh, a blend of what a provider can do, like the physician who might be able to prescribe some medication, but also it takes a lot of uh, partnership with the individual themselves to control their diet, um, exercise, um, other things like that. So same thing is true for dental disease, like dental caries, for example, uh, it's the adoption of what I call mouth healthy habits. So people mostly about what you eat and, and how well you clean your mouth every day. Those things are critical. And it's, it's actually the most important thing that determines whether someone has good dental health or not is what I call daily mouth habits. Now, it's really hard to have people understand what they need to do or, or influence them to do it. But we do know some things about what it takes to influence people's behavior. And what we know is that people are more likely to adopt mouth healthy habits if they can have message delivered by someone they consider trusted members of their own community. So for a dentist to give what I call the speech, the dentist give the speech where they tell people, you know, you need to brush your teeth more or whatever and stop eating so much sugar. Um, many people sort of tune out when the dentist is talking, they might nod and smile, but people tend to think, studies have shown people tend to think that dentists are very smart. We have lots of information, but we don't really understand their lives and we don't understand how stressed they are or how difficult it is to do some of the things we're suggesting. So we know that uh, uh, it's really helpful if multiple people deliver the same message. So there's nothing wrong with a dentist delivering those messages, but when they can be partnering with someone who's in a community organization like a school who can help to reinforce those messages, that's really much better. And not only just reinforce the same messages, but we know the most effective thing you can do if you're trying to influence someone to adopt mouth healthy habits is to suggest small incremental behavior change. So I want you to try just one small thing you know, today, let me check with you tomorrow and see how that went. And tomorrow, hey, it went okay. Well, why don't you try something else? Or that was a little difficult. Well, maybe just let's work on that little thing for a few more days. Um, and ongoing reinforcement and coaching and peer support is the most effective thing. Now, you really cannot do that in the context of a dental office. Uh, people are not in dental offices. Most people who have most of the disease are not in dental offices at all, or they're only for emergency treatment. And then many people who are there even on a more regular basis, there's no opportunity for the dentist to say, let me check with you tomorrow and see how things went. So uh, enlisting and including dental care systems that, that engage community structures like schools and preschools is really critical towards having people do the most important thing, which is uh, adopting mouth healthy habits. So let me now move from that idea of we have all this new prevention and behavior science to talking about something else, which is how do you actually bring dental care to people who have so much trouble getting into dental offices? And this is a system I'm gonna present. We call it the virtual dental home system. It's a system that, um, as it says, uh, tries to duplicate the idea of the dental home. You may have heard of the idea of medical homes or health homes. This is the concept of uh, helping people to manage their own disease, making sure they don't get lost in our complicated healthcare system, making sure they get the care they needed. But we set out to show that we could make that work for dental care in a system where we call the geographically distributed telehealth connected team. In other words, different people in different places, but they're working together, making one team that's providing dental care. So we call it the virtual dental home. And how does it work? Well, here's a uh, dental hygienist with some portable equipment and her, uh, the dental assistant. And so they're going into a place like a school or a Head Start Center, they're collecting lots of digital records. So this might be, here you see them collecting x-rays, and uh, photographs, you can see a little picture of the tooth back on the laptop in the back. Uh, they're collecting really a full set of digital dental records, the same thing you would get in a dental office where they're using fully digital electronic dental records, which most dental offices are these days. And uh, so that includes now uh, all the images, charting, health history, consent forms, all that stuff is, is available inside this now fully populated uh, dental record. And um, the dentist now has the opportunity to uh, review all those records and make a decision about whether what should happen next. And um, uh, we're finding that the dentist who's not on site can actually do a full dental examination if they have the right records. If they're working with a calibrated team, they can make those decisions They can help direct care. And um, with the addition of uh, something else in California now, we actually have the ability for dental hygienists to place these small fillings. So. Uh, again, this is done with no shots, no drilling, um, uh, very, but it doesn't hurt. It can be done quickly and easily, um, helps kids not be afraid of dental care in the future. And so you take this tooth on this low income child where normally what happens in her situation is nothing until she ends up with a bigger and bigger hole in her tooth and then a toothache and then not learning in school, 
and maybe in a trip to the emergency room down the road. And now in a few minutes, the dental hygienist in the school can actually seal that caries in place, um, put in a restoration that can last for many, many years and stop all the downstream consequences that we just talked about. So we did a big demonstration of this whole idea uh, in California. We did it across for six years. We did it across 50 different uh, sites, 13 different communities, 50 different sites. Um, and we were trying to demonstrate, and we did demonstrate the fact that you could really make this idea of telehealth connected teams work. You could have different people in different places and they could work together and form a full service system of care. So some of the big takeaways from that uh, demonstration were that um, you could reach people who were not getting care traditionally by bringing care to where they were. Uh, when you're in places like schools or Head Start centers or preschools, you're able to emphasize prevention, early intervention, all that lowers the cost. It lowers the cost of both the early intervention and preventive procedures themselves, and it also lowers the cost of all the downstream consequences of not addressing disease early. Um, we found that the majority of people, and, and particularly in children, could be kept healthy uh, and verified healthy on site. What I mean by verified healthy is the dentist through the telehealth system could say, all right, you're healthy now. Um, you don't need to come to my office. I think everything's okay. Well, we'll let, let's just get some new x-rays in six months or whatever the next step is. But they didn't necessarily need to go to the dental office. That, that's really different than a, a school-based uh, uh, screening and fluoride varnish program or a school-based sealant program where at the end of whatever intervention takes place, every child and parent needs to, is told, um, you, we didn't do a complete exam, so now you need to go see a dentist for the exam. In this system, that exam has been done. The children who are healthy are verified healthy. And that means that all of the, um, all of the resources that you have for follow-up and uh, care navigation can be now focused on just those children who really need to get into the dental office because they have more advanced problems instead of trying to dilute those resources across all the children by telling everyone they need to go to a dental office. So with the system, we found that two thirds of the children in this big demonstration, everything they needed to have done could be done by the dental hygienist on site, um, which is a huge difference from what normally happens with low income children, which is nothing until they get an advanced disease and have all the problems we've already talked about. And actually that was before this medication I mentioned a few minutes ago, silver diamine fluoride was available in the United States. So now we understand that we're predicting that about 80% uh, of children could actually be kept healthy at the school without needing to make that trip to a dental office. So the dentist is still involved. I don't want anybody to think this is sort of separating the system from dental office care. The dentist is still involved, but they're involved over the telehealth system and much less involved with everyone trooping to the dental office. Um, this is actually a boon for dentists these days, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes because of the more difficult situation they have in providing dental care with all of the precautions they need to take in the era of COVID. Um, the system also integrates dental care in with the community organizations much more than a fluoride varnish or a screening system does, or even a school-based sealant program does. And it also brings dentists into the system. So you really have do have a full service system of care. So we've been doing, we started doing this in 2008. We talked and planned before that, but in 2008, we started that big uh, six year demonstration. And uh, in 2010, we were probably the only state, maybe some other states were doing something along this arena. But by um, 2020, by this year, it's all over the country. More and more states are adopting either uh, funded programs that we're actually working with people in other states, which is the dark blue, or we're doing some helping people get doing something with them in, in, uh, in the lighter blue, or we're having conversations or, or understanding that people are doing things along this line um, in the tan or orange states. So, and I can't even keep this map fully updated, but it's really beginning to sweep the country. So the take home from all that is what we're moving towards is something I'm now referring to as community engaged dental care systems. We used to think about dental care as happening in a dental office. The dental office is the center of the dental universe. If you wanna get, uh, have good dental health, you call a dentist, you make an appointment, you go to the office periodically and the dentist does things to you in the office. That was dental care. But now we're realizing that we can have really a much more effective uh, way of producing dental care, particularly for people who have difficulty getting into dental offices by demonstrating and, and engaging what we call community engaged dental care system. So the dental office is a part of it, but also the schools, the Head Start centers, um, residential facilities for people with disabilities, other places are also a part of that system. It's a distributed system with different people in different places, but all part of one complete care system. Uh, let me just give you an example of how this might work in an environment where let's say, for example, you have a 
uh, school-based uh, health center. So school-based health centers are mostly pretty small, one or two dental chairs. Mostly they engage uh, um, health centers uh, who have a dental clinic somewhere in the community that go and staff the health center. You have a dentist that comes in and everything that happens happens in those couple of chairs in the school-based health center. The dentist takes x-rays and they do preventive procedures and teeth cleaning and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of those things don't have to be done by the dentist. They don't have to be done in a dental chair. So imagine if you took that school-based health center and um, you thought about, well, what are all the places around in the community where there are children who might not be able to get into the school-based health center, both because it's inconvenient or transportation issues or the school-based health center is just up to capacity. And you started to put dental hygienists into those school-based health centers. And so you had a dental hygienist in one of the feeder schools where um, doing a virtual dental home system like I just showed you. So they're in the feeder school using portable equipment. Um, maybe they're not even there five days a week. They could be there one day every other week, but they're taking x-rays or taking photographs and doing the preventive procedures. Um, and then you have another one in a different feeder school for that school-based health center and another one there and there and there. Uh, and, uh, and then you connect all those through the telehealth system that we've been talking about. And now you actually have a distributed system of care where the stuff that has to be done by the dentist uh, sitting in a dental chair is actually done in the school-based health center. But the things that can be done by the dental hygienist, all the prevention, early intervention procedures to reach a lot more children and keep them healthy can be done in the feeder schools. And they're all connected into one system of care using a telehealth system like we just, just talked about. Um, so that's an example of using it within a school district where the, the school-based health center might be in a middle school or a, or a high school and engaging lots of preschools or feeder schools into that system. Um, you can also think about doing the same kind of thing in, let's for example, a more rural area where some of you uh, likely are. And so in rural areas, the common wisdom in dental care is you just don't open a dental office in a place like that. There's just not enough population density for the dentist to make a living. So dentists tend not to have dental offices in places like that. But what if, the, if you could uh, uh, think about a dental office that was in a place like that um, only they weren't trying to count on all the people that are in all these outlying areas as being their patients and making the 50 mile drive to where their office is on a very regular basis. But instead of that, you had a dental hygienist who um, opened a small preventive office like we've been talking about. Uh, maybe that's just have a room in a, in a medical clinic somewhere, or even in a pharmacy or some other kind of location where they were doing the things we just talked about with portable equipment, collecting records and providing prevention, uh, preventive care. And you had uh, several of those places where the hygienist maybe wasn't in any one at five days a week. So they're going around to various places. Maybe you have a couple of hygienists, but it all then becomes one telehealth connected team system. And now that dentist who opened, who wasn't going to open up the office there before, now they can actually make a living by having an office where the office is the place where they do the more advanced surgical procedures and they can um, uh, actually take care of a whole bigger community than they could have thought about otherwise because a lot of people are getting prevention early intervention care not in that office and then maybe every once in a while they mean, need to make that trip to the office for more complicated care um, people are willing to do that so it's just another way of thinking about distributed care systems both thinking about that in a school-based health center within a district and also thinking about in a geographically uh, rural area and lots of ways of thinking about this hub and spoke system so this is really revolutionizing our thinking about where we need to go in dental uh, health and particularly applicable for children in school environments. Um, but we've all taken a little bit of a detour in our lives these days because of the global pandemic and COVID-19. And uh, that has had a particular impact on dental care. There was initially lots of concern about the uh, aerosol producing procedures in dental offices. So this was a chart showing um, the risk of, of providing care the green bars are healthcare services and the blue bars are, or the blue circles are non-healthcare. And they listed uh, dentists and hygienists and assistants way at the far end. So the highest risk uh, professionals of anybody in this whole chart because of the fact that we produce all these aerosols that spray viruses into the air when we do dental care. Um, it seems to have not worked out that is quite as uh, scary as, it, as we thought with all of the effective protective measures that people are taking in dental offices. They seem to be able to keep um, dental offices from being, from being uh, super spreading uh, environments. Um, and in fact, here's something from the uh, National Academies of Science that was looking at the uh, risk and importance of various kinds of professions, dentists, and they ended up concluding with this chart 
that dentists are among the most important uh, things and they're trying to balance risk and infection. Basically the conclusion was people should go to dental offices or go get dental care at least. They didn't use the word office, they just said dentists. Um, so right now uh, we know from data from the American Dental Association that 98% of dental offices are open across the country. But still when you ask dentists, this is some survey data that 94% of dentists anticipate long-term changes in dental practice as a base because of COVID-19. In fact, they're talking about things like um, all the pre-appointment screenings that they're gonna have to do, taking people's temperatures, they come in the office, all of the additional disinfection and wearing uh, PPE, per, uh, personal protective equipment that they have to wear, um, just slows down practice. Dentists have in the past sort of gone from one room to another. They would start a procedure in one room or while they're waiting for something, they go to another room. You can't do that with all this personal protective equipment, it's just too hard and too expensive to take it on and off to bounce between rooms. So it really slowed down the efficiency of, of offices. So to deal with that, there's been lots of guidelines that have come out. The American Dental Association has a very extensive toolkit about returning to work. And there's lots of guidelines from the Center for Disease Control. But what I find fascinating about all these guidelines is that uh, there's an, they're actually mentioned in all of them, this idea of this uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, uh, NIOSH, has come out with this chart about hierarchy of controls. If you're trying to mitigate risks, how do you do it? And they've listed them by the least effective at the bottom of this inverted pyramid and the most effective at the top. Almost all of the attention in the dental industry right now is on the things at the bottom of the pyramid about PP. How do we get enough personal protective equipment? What are all the guidelines for putting it on and putting it off? And how long do you have to leave the room uh, empty before you disinfect it? And what kind of disinfection procedures you use? And how do we set up airflow systems? Almost all the attention is on what's deemed by NASH as the least effective things you can do. The things at the top of the chart about eliminating the barriers, which are the most effective, eliminating the risks, which are the most effective, um, or he's substituting something else, again, at the most effective end of the scale, much less attention to them. So I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes now about how dental offices are beginning to think and how we can help them think about uh, the most, and putting into place the most effective uh, controls. And so we'll start that with this idea of this diagram of a dental office. And in this diagram, you see this little picture of the office down here. And in this area here, highly modified operatory. So dentists are gonna to have to do some things about operating differently in some parts of their office. Lots of controls, they have to have different airflow systems. They're gonna be wearing, they already are wearing lots of personal protective equipment. They gotta put the equipment on before they go into the room and they've gotta leave it on and then don't take it off until they, until they exit the room. They can't be leaving that room and going doing something else in the middle of a procedure. So really slows down the productivity in an office based on doing procedures that produce aerosols. Dentists are also beginning to realize that some of the things that they were previously doing that produced aerosols, they don't have to do them that way now. With all the new prevention science, some minimally invasive procedures, like we talked about before, silver diamine fluoride and interim therapeutic restorations and other kinds of things can be done without producing aerosols. And so some part of the office might not need as much engineering and PPE controls as other parts. But the most important part of this diagram is this cloud here. I talk about it as not the dark cloud, the bright cloud, which is about incorporating a teledentistry system into the office environment. And so this is something where you think about how do you um, engage people before and after their visits using teledentistry, some kind of pre and post visit care system. So there's lots of really good systems that are out there um, that allow uh, offices to do some really remarkable things. So they can have a video conference with the patient ahead of time. They can talk to them about, to understand the patient's uh, concerns, talk to them about what they're coming, uh, what they're coming in for if they don't already have it planned, um, exp explain what's gonna go on. Um, in some number of uh, cases, the patient's not gonna have to come in at all. We've been doing a survey of dentists and they're predicting maybe 20 or 30% of patients if they could have a really good conversation and with a video conference system and maybe collect some photographs, the patient wouldn't need to come in at all. So that's just a lot less traffic in the office and a lot less use of PPE if someone doesn't have to come in if they got a good video conference system. And other people might need to come in, but um, they can still have a much shorter visit so they can take care of a lot of paperwork. You can update health histories, you can update all the demographics and then make sure they have the right insurance information. Um, people can actually sign consent forms. You can explain to them what's gonna happen. They can sign the consent form over the telehealth uh, system and through real-time radio. Uh, and which means that when someone does come in, they're spending less time in the office. They're not having to do all that standing, filling out paperwork, talking about what their concerns are, talking about uh, what's going to happen. All that can happen over the telehealth system. And so they spend less time in the office. All that has huge benefits for reducing the cost 
and the risk of, uh, of infection uh, control, reducing the traffic at the office. Um, most people are gonna be very happy once they realize that they can actually have some things taken care of without a trip to the office or have a shorter visit in the office by having things taken care of ahead of time. So a lot of patient appreciation for having these systems. Uh, I predict this is gonna be everywhere, but it's really, it's gonna be a slow adoption. Some offices have already moved in this direction. Others have not yet. So there's gonna be slow adoption, but inevitably this is the way that the dental care system's going. But the thing you can also think about is once an office has mastered the idea of using a teledentistry system to connect with people, then you can actually move on to connecting with people in the community. So this is where the office, if they have a telehealth system, they can actually begin to make connections with um, places you see here like residential facilities and schools and preschools, community centers and businesses and use their telehealth system. They actually have the kind of interaction I showed you earlier where you can have some of the people who work in the office can actually be in the community, dental hygienists in the school again, that example, the virtual dental home kind of system. And all of this becomes one system of care where you're actually reaching people who are traditionally not getting care you're applying prevention and early intervention interactions. You're keeping most people healthy in the community site. You're using the office for the more advanced and complicated procedures that have to be, have to be done there. It's a much more efficient system of care. It's much more likely to produce a population who has good oral health. And particularly when you're talking about underserved populations, low-income people with all of the social determinants, uh, with transportation barriers and language barriers and work hour barriers and geography barriers and all those things can be addressed by bringing care to where people are, which is where we started with this presentation, bringing care where people are using this telehealth connected team system where everyone's a part of the same team, but different people are working in different places and doing different parts of the system. So how do we move from a system we have now where most dental practices are not doing this? We have some work in schools, but it doesn't tend to be this fully connected a full service dental care system. So people are doing some partial work in schools. How do we move to that environment that we have now to one more like this, where we can start to see this full service system of care that's in place throughout a, uh, a school system or, or, or working with preschools? Well, so there are a number of challenges when you start to think about adoption. How do we get to this idea of full service community engaged dental care systems that, that make all these connections and really uh, employ uh, incentives, payment, uh, delivery systems, and prevention and behavior science. So I think that there are three main um, three main uh, things to think about. One is awareness, that some of you may be fully aware of the kind of things i just been talking about. Others may be hearing this for the first time, but we still have a long ways to go to let people even understand that this is all possible, that we can actually do this kind of thing. We can use telehealth connected team systems and bring care to where people are much more effectively than systems where the idea is the, you do screenings and you try and refer everyone into a dental office. They're much more effective systems like this. Um, so there's a lot of awareness building to even people understand the basic concepts and ideas here. And then once we uh, begin to increase a sort of parallel to that uh, awareness about how, what can be done and how this can be so much more beneficial, there's also policy barriers that there are some limitations, even in California, which is very advanced compared to other states, some barriers in what things, uh, what things can be done. Um, right now, we just had a bill that I was very involved in sponsoring that uh, was vetoed by the governor, very disappointing, that would have allowed health centers to establish patients as their patient, which they have to do before they can bill for services, establish patient as their patient using a telehealth system. They can't do that right now. They have to establish the patient with an in-person visit, and then they can use telehealth, which makes no sense from a care system point of view. So that bill did not pass. There's lots more work to do to try and increase, uh, go back at it again, which, which the coalition that I've been working with will do. Um, so we have some policy things, make sure things are paid for and adequately supported. And then we have implementation challenges. Even if everything is uh, allowed and, and people are aware of what can be done, it's still not easy to do this kind of stuff where um, uh, people are not really uh, used to this kind of system. It's different for particularly dental practices, don't really know necessarily how to work this way. As all of you, I'm sure, appreciate coming from most of you imagine are uh, involved with schools that schools may not be the easiest systems for a dental office to negotiate with, get an MOU with. Um, so those things are all barriers to dental offices figuring out how to do this. Um, I do a lot of, spend a lot of my time these days doing consulting. So that's what I do. A lot of the programs I'm involved with are just helping people figure out um, how to do this. We've got a whole training methodology now to help people from square one to uh, having a 
a fully and uh, functioning um, full service virtual dental home system. So if anybody's interested in, in um, talking further about that, I'd be happy to talk to you further about how we can help you develop those systems and support the providers in your area to be able to do this. And then we think particularly about uh, getting back to school. And so now we're in an environment where even some people who are doing this have had to cut way back because of the of COVID and the fact that the schools are not open. Schools are of course in California beginning to open. It really varies from school district to school district as I'm sure you all, you all know. Um, but we're starting to put together a set of guidelines and work with all the partners that we're in touch with about how do you get back into school. And so um, these are some of the high points of the guidelines is, you know, we're encouraging people to plan this together with, with uh, uh, lead people in the school, how do providers begin to uh, offer services. Um, it has to start with some communication. So um, people need to understand, I'd say people, both the administrators, the teachers and the parents need to understand that it is possible to provide dental care in a school environment, do it safely. Um, you can actually use the proper kinds of protections and do it in a way that you're not um, endangering uh, children and their families with the potential of risk uh, tr uh, risk transmission or infection transmission. So a lot of communication about how do you actually do it safely. And then people I think also need to understand the benefit of doing it, that dental disease is one disease that doesn't go away by itself. When you've got dental problems, they only go in one direction, they get worse. And to have a long, now we've had many children who've had a long hiatus and last time they had any dental care because of the, of COVID. And predictably their, whatever kind of conditions they had in their mouth, they're not getting any better. They're getting worse and bringing care onto schools and beginning to start up that uh, safe and effective care system is really critical for them to not get into real trouble with dental care in the future. Um, a lot of dentists that are, practices that are opening up are saying that their appointment books are really sort of full right now with people having a lot of problems based on uh, having neglected everything for, for now, you know, six or eight months. And so um, it's really critical that we um, be able to help people understand how we can do safe and effective care in the school, in the environment where they are. And then finally, um, both for the dental team and have other people understand, it's possible to do uh, dental care with minimal interventions and maximal health and maximal uh, protection against transmission risk. And that's um, by using adequate protection. There's fully understood now how to do that. Um, it's actually all the things that I talked about in terms of stuff that's done in the schools with all the traditional dental hygiene procedures and sealants and uh, silver diamine fluoride and interim therapeutic restorations. Those all can be done with producing zero aerosols. Um, it's not the way they're always done in the past, but it's possible now when people are educated. That's one of the things we're doing is training people how to do this, those procedures without any aerosols. And with a little bit of distancing, uh, spacing and timing of visits into whatever location, looking for a place that's got a big airspace. So you don't want to do this in a really tiny closet, but you can do this in a place where it's like maybe an auditorium that's not being used or the cafeteria if it's not open or even a large classroom, but to try to get a place where there's a lot of, uh, of air circulation. Um, it all can be done very effectively and, uh, and easily. So if, if your school has had it in the past and uh, you're worried about, oh, about starting up again, um, be happy to help you uh, with some information about how to um, let people understand it can be done. It's really critical and it can be done safely and effectively. And if you're in a school district that hasn't done anything like this before, again, uh, happy to talk to folks about how do you get a system like this going because we know that dental care has been neglected during this pandemic and we need to be able to help people get dental care and stop, uh, stop the progression of the disease and not get into all of the trouble that children get into when they have uh, dental care that gets out of control when they're not learning in school and they're ending up in emergency rooms and sometimes even life-threatening situations. So um, I will stop there. My uh, contact information is on um, the slide, uh, paul.glassman at cnsu.edu if you want to email to me. And um, now we'll just open things up for whatever you all want to talk about. Uh, um, so I think I can't see the question box, but uh, Kelly is uh, on the line as our host and moderator for the session and she can see the question box. So feel free to uh, put questions in there and um, let's try to have a conversation. Let's talk about what's on your mind. So Kelly, I'll see if you anything in the question box at this point. All right, right now we don't have any questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to write it. Um, we do have someone in the chat that says, thank you for addressing this. Cause I think it's definitely very important. So I'll just wait a couple more seconds if anyone has any questions again go ahead and write in the q a and i will announce it 
Um, please uh, jump in when you see some questions. I'll start, uh, Kelly, with some things that often come up in the Q&A portion of these sessions that may be of interest to the audience. So typically people ask me a couple different things. So <clears throat> one is that um, uh, dentists, if they're first hearing about this, can be very surprised to hear that dentists are doing an examination using a telehealth system. And, and dentists are so used to doing examinations in person that some dentists just can't imagine. How can you actually do an examination if you're just in a telehealth system, you're looking at a computer screen? And so I want to reassure <clears throat> those dentists who may be listening or those of you who may be talking to dentists at some point about these kind of things that it is really possible to do a dental examination using a telehealth system. We now have uh, more than 15 years experience doing it. Um, there is uh, some uh, actual scientific studies that are published that have shown uh, looking at a dentist who's doing an examination with just looking at computer-based records versus computer-based records plus the in-person examination. And what those studies show is that dentists make the same decisions whether they're looking at the computer-based records with or without the in-person examination. In other words, they don't need the in-person examination to come to the same conclusions. Very little variability, actually much more variability between different dentists because there is uh, a difference of opinion about dentists about various situations and what kind of things they should do or not do. And so we have much less variability um, between a single dentist. So it's clearly with, well within the range of dentist decision makers. That's one thing is the, um, <clears throat> just the scientific evidence that, that, that you don't need the in-person exam. And then also sometimes dentists can feel better when they start to think about the fact, they think about this as, okay, I'm gonna look at this computer screen and I have to make a decision based on what I see, even if I'm not, don't feel like I have enough information. And I think you can help dentists uh, think about the fact that no, you don't have to make a decision that way. You can actually, if you feel like you don't have enough information, you can talk to the hygienist, request more information. Maybe there's an x-ray that doesn't show part of a tooth you need to see, take another x-ray, just the same as a dentist would in an in, in-person in visit where they don't feel like they have all the information, they can still get more information. They can have a phone call with the hygienist and talk over, hey, I see a little brown spot there. Can you tell me whether it's hard or soft? That might make a difference in what we do. So, um, so they have the we ability have to interact questions. and get more information if they need it. Um, Oh, Kelly, sorry, Dr. Glassman. Yes, uh, we have two questions here. Do you have any ideas or ways where in-person VDH can still happen in the community during this time? Um, yeah, um, let me just say one more thing about the dentist exam and then I'll address that, which is that um, the other thing that's important to realize is that when a dentist looks at a set of records, some of them are gonna be really obviously healthy. There's just clearly no problem. Be, it would be, make no sense for that person to have to make the child or family about to make a trip to the dental office. Um, and, and some of them are clearly have so many problems that they need to go to dental. There's no question about it. So it's really only the areas in the middle where the dentist has to make a decision. And they always have the option to say, you know, I just don't have the information I need. So I think hopefully you'll be able to reassure dentists. They really can do an effective uh, job of providing care for people who, um, who, who are being accessed over a telehealth system. So now the other question about um, examples or, or ways of thinking about how do you start practices like this now? Um, yes, it can be done in multiple ways. Um, in uh, in the uh, one of the school districts we've been working with for a long time, the um, Twin River School District in Sacramento and now the Sacramento Unified School District, because they've had a lot of experience doing this, they realized the value in it. They've actually declared the virtual dental home as an essential service that they wanna get going as quickly as possible. So they're going to be starting to do some uh, outdoor. Um, they have outdoor uh, for for uh, school-based uh, uh, free lunch programs. People are coming by and picking up a uh, a meal for the children, and they're going to have a little outdoor area where the dental team is going to be able to set up their equipment and actually do all the stuff we were talking about: take the records and do preventive procedures under a little tent kind of structure. Um, there's other schools that are actually just opening up. I mean, they're letting the uh, dental team come in and set up, even if the school's not fully open or it's only open maybe part-time or children are on a staggered schedule, they're still letting the dental team come in. And of course they're being, uh, they're doing all the stuff I talked about before, no aerosol producing procedures. They're spacing out the time between children so you don't have a bunch of people sitting around together. They're uh, making sure that they're doing full infection control. They're working in a big airspace, but there's some schools where they're actually already beginning to deliver the services. So some children are actually not, necessarily scheduled to be at school that day, maybe it works now more like an appointment system where the parents can make an appointment and come to the school while the dental team is there. So there's different uh, schools are beginning to um, use different styles of beginning to open up, but it's starting to, to happen around, uh, around more schools these days. 
Kelly, you said there was a second question also? Yes, sorry, I was on mute. So our second question, and then we have another one after that. Um, what do you think about telehealth and a dental therapist? Would they be able to use telehealth like a hygienist? Um, yes, of course, a dental therapist would be able to participate in the same kind of system. Um, as some of you may know, dental therapy is a pretty controversial issue across the, the United States uh, about using them or not. Um, I don't have any problem with the concept of dental therapists, but I think it's a little bit uh, overkill for the situation we're talking about, because what we're finding is that uh, the majority of children now we're talking about close to 80% of children can have everything they need at least be maintained healthy. Um, two thirds, of everything they need, 80% uh, maintained healthy with the services of a dental hygienist, just doing the things that hygienists are currently allowed to do. So we don't have any dental therapists in California right now. That, that's not a, we don't have a license category where they're allowed to do that. Therapists, uh, for those of you not familiar with that term, are uh, allied dental personnel who are trained to do, um, in addition to the preventive procedures that a hygienist can do, trained to do fillings and, and simple extractions. And, um, uh, you know, the whole, the whole issue is that it's really an emphasis on the surgical intervention. And we're finding that we can go so far down the road without needing surgical intervention that uh, I don't have any problem with having therapists or maybe for those children who do need to have um, some fillings done, having them be available to do those on the school site. But uh, I wouldn't certainly have them as the front line. I would have the dental, uh, the public health dental hygienists who have the ability to do all of the preventive and early intervention procedures we talked about and be able to uh, keep the vast majority of children healthy. I would start with that. And then maybe for a few children or a, a therapist who could go kind of from place to place only for those children who actually need to have um, fillings done, that might be, might be an answer. But I don't think it's the, it's the place we want to start or, the, or the, the idea we want to emphasize because we're hoping to emphasize the fact that you can keep so many people healthy without surgical interventions to bring in a person who's really trained and gets paid mostly for doing surgical interventions is, I don't think, the place to start. Thank you. And then um, our last question is, given the school reopening issues schools are dealing with, how could we approach uh, schools to resume our school-based oral health services? Um, so I'm guessing that question, just the way it was worded, might have been from a provider, not, not someone in a school. Um, and um, so if that's correct, what we're, we're doing with the, school, with the providers that we're working with is, um, uh, helping to put together some talking points and information, but even without those, is really to start to approach the school administrators. Now, school administrators are very busy these days. They've got a lot on their minds. They're not necessarily op uh, open to having long conversations and negotiations with the dental team, but to the extent that you can figure out a way to get an audience and have, start to have the conversation, I think it's really a matter of uh, <clears throat> presenting the uh, evidence and helping people understand the importance of dental care. What we were talking about earlier, that it doesn't uh, get better by itself, that it is possible to do on-site dental care safely and, and effectively using the, the things that we were, have been talking about. And once you can get um, some understanding of the fact of how important it is and uh, the fact that it can be done in a way that's safe and, and effective, then you can move on to talking about the details of how do you actually do it. And then, then, we, then there's all the negotiations about, you know, can you get a space where there's a big enough uh, airflow and how do you schedule people or do you make appointments uh, so on the side so they come in at a certain at a certain time um, how are you going to get kids to walk back and forth from the classroom to the place where the dental team is all those things that might have been worked out previously probably need to be rethought rethought through but um, it has to start with some conversations of people just helping people understand that it's really critical and that it can be safe and effective and so I think the dental team uh, needs to be knocking on the doors and trying to get an audience, but also those of you who work for the schools, um, you can be very helpful in that and helping if you're not a high level administrator, helping the high level administrators understand the importance and the benefit and why this is critical. And then maybe facilitating some of those conversations to start and take place and, and keep going. Uh, let's see, yes, they said they are a public health dentist and direct the San Mateo County Oral Health Program. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, there's been a fair amount of use of this teledentistry system in San Mateo County. It's actually pretty widespread, really. And uh, yeah, so th having those conversations about reopening is are really are really critical. 
Um, any other questions in the box? I got something else I could bring up if not, uh, Kelly. Um, not currently. So, um, you know, another thing that, again, if you're talking to dentists who maybe um, uh, you're in contact with, but aren't really doing this kind of bringing care onto the school sites, at least not full service care. Um, sometimes the question is, can we actually get paid for this? How do we get paid for that? And so I think maybe you can help the dentist realize that in fact, in California, uh, we do have a payment system that uh, it's actually even a little bit more effective during the COVID time because of the declared emergency than it was prior. We're hoping some of those uh, relaxed regulations are gonna continue on to uh, post COVID. But certainly right now, um, dentists can get paid for uh, interactions with patients using um, both synchronous and asynchronous video conference. They can actually engage patients starting with uh, telehealth systems. The patient doesn't have to have an in-person visit to establish them as a patient. That legislation I mentioned a few minutes ago was to try to ensure that uh, providers, dental providers could continue to engage patients initially and declare them uh, as their own patients um, after the COVID emergency is over. So that's not successful yet, but while we're still in the emergency regulations and hopefully it'll get changed afterwards, um, there's really sort of full uh, full benefits for doing telehealth connected teams right now. So dentists can, can do this, dentists or health centers uh, can do this, they can get paid for it. Um, you know, some of them may need a little bit of training and how to do it and, and how to set up the payment system so we can help them with that. But it certainly is is very much, very much available uh, now. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions so far, Kelly. Mm -hmm. We have one question. Do you think telehealth and oral care will grow in the next 10 years? Would it affect traditional office visits? Um, yes, my uh, crystal ball, which I have to admit is uh, not any less foggy than anyone else's, so I don't have any magic insight to the future, but I do believe just the way I'm, I've been working with these telehealth connected systems and the way I see them being adopted and the interest I see growing in California and across the country, I absolutely convinced this is gonna be the future. It's not that every office is gonna be doing this, but we're gonna have lots of dental care systems that are gonna figure out how to become community engaged systems where they're gonna have parts of their team in the community side and they're gonna be working together using uh, teledentistry systems, connecting it into a full service system of care it just, I mean, just the evidence of looking at the various states that are beginning to pass rules about this is just, it, it's just an, an unstoppable tide, I think. So, um, and, and look at even in dental education where I'm involved in dental schools, you know, the younger generation of dentists and dental students are very interested in this kind of stuff. They've grown up with technology. They really can't understand why it's not already in more broad, uh, broad uh, based use. And so um, both from the providers, from payment systems, from growing realization that you can do a more effective job of uh, of reaching people and keeping people healthy. I have absolutely no doubt that this is gonna to continue to grow uh, into the future. Um, not that it's not gonna be a bumpy road. It is, it is or it has been, and it will continue to be a bumpy road. We have, sometimes I feel like we take two steps forward and one step back, and then there's policy things that sort of, you know, undermine something you thought you'd already settled. Um, uh, things like that are gonna to continue to happen. And so it, it I will certainly be continue to be involved in this for the foreseeable future. But the question asked about, you know, sort of the decade long uh, a right time horizon, and I'm absolutely convinced this will become more and more um, ubiquitous in the next decade. And certainly everybody who's listening here can have a role in that, that um, your, your uh, uh, advocacy, you're helping to make people aware that it's even possible, will have a, a big impact on uh, on moving it forward because the first step is just got to be awareness and people uh, number one understanding it's possible number two getting over some of the initial um, fear-based reactions or dentists are afraid of competition or people just saying that's too complicated and I don't know how to do it and convincing them it's possible so all that awareness building is really critical I think everyone everyone who's listening here can be part of that awareness uh, building uh, into the next decade to, to have that uh, that uh, prediction come true Um, does anyone have any other questions? We still have four minutes. Okay, we have, have you seen any changes in oral health education and prevention with children in telehealth slash dentistry? Um, I'm not sure if the question was related to um, educating dentists and hygienists or the education was just in use of these systems. But um, <clears throat> If it's talking about the question, it was about use of these systems. Yes, that they're just dramatic differences in terms of the the, the science, 
and the systems that we have now that can use prevention and uh, and the ability to, um, I, I, I think the word was educating people, but I, I, I don't so much like the idea of educating people. I like the idea of supporting people adopting uh, healthy lifestyles. And the reason I make a distinction between supporting people helping adopt uh, healthy lifestyles and educating people to um, do a better job of uh, brushing and, and flossing and eating, um, because educating sounds like it's kind of a top-down thing. You know, I'm the, I'm the person with the information. I'm going to tell you what to do, and then you're going to go do it. And that's not the way that change happens in the real world. It happens when someone sees the change as important for them and that they go through the steps that they need to, uh, to start with a new uh, way of doing things and turn that into a, a new habit. And so that requires a lots of partnership and uh, involvement um, from the individual themselves who's going to adopt the new system. So I think about the idea of supporting people to make those changes, supporting people to adopt healthy lifestyles is more, uh, is the way we should think about it. It's more like what actually happens. And it is more uh, just sort of using terms that recognize the critical role that the individual themselves has to play if we're going to um, help them. So yeah, we know a lot more about that now. I've talked a little bit about it in the last hour about how to help support people. And these systems are, are, are pretty well understood now, um, but we have a long ways to go for them to be fully understood even by the dental professionals and then even a longer ways to go to have them be adopted and really be a part of dental practice. Kelly, anything else in the last uh, minute that we have? Um, nope, I think that is it. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Glassman. I do wanna say that the presentation will be, um, it is, being recorded and will be available for everyone at a later time. Great, and I just wanna thank everyone who uh, attended here. I, I'm a firm believer, as you've heard, that um, everyone's gotta be involved in these things, that this is not something you can just leave it up to the dentist to do, that it's gotta be a partnership between the dental professionals and the people who work in schools, and that everyone here has a critical role. Um, as I said, I don't wanna to be too repetitive, but uh, I just wanna emphasize dental disease doesn't go away by itself. And we actually have low cost effective systems of bringing care to where people are in schools, in preschools that are just so much better, uh, particularly for people who have challenges getting into dental offices, so much better for everyone. They're better for the oral health professional, they're better for the people, they're better for payers who have to pay out less money for repairing disease down the road. And so I wanna thank you for being here, encouraging you to continue to spread the word about these possibilities and uh, wish everyone um, a good rest of the conference. So thank you.